Welcome back to the Core EM Podcast. Core content for anyone, anywhere, and just in time. This is the official podcast of the NYU Bellevue EM Residency Program. This week on the podcast, we're going to have a lecture that I gave this week at conference on the management of acute pulmonary edema or acute decompensated heart failure. We did a comprehensive post on this topic a while back, and that post is considerably more detailed than the lecture. All of the studies alluded to in the talk are in the post, and we'll drop a link to that in the show notes. All right, let's drop into the talk. Acute pulmonary edema, we talked last year a little bit about spectrum of disease. I think often acute pulmonary edema gets lumped into CHF exacerbation, but it is a much different disease process, and that's why I want to spend a little bit more time on it. Now, the key is that the first 10 minutes of management in these patients is going to make all the difference. What you do in the first 10 minutes determines whether the patient ends up in the ICU, whether the patient ends up intubated, and how sick they end up being down the line. So what we do in that first 10 minutes makes a huge difference in these patients' outcomes. The goals for what I want to talk to you guys about today, I really just have three. I'm going to talk a little bit about diagnosis and pathophysiology, because understanding the pathophysiology here makes the treatment very simple and straightforward. We'll talk about respiratory support, if you need it, how you're going to do it, and then we'll talk about targeted management. This topic used to be a little bit of a longer talk. I think at one point it was a 60 minute lecture and then it was 45 and I paired it back. I've taken a lot of the data and original studies out of it, but all of that information, if you're interested in where I'm getting my data from, it all lives on a core EM post on acute pulmonary edema. If it's not there, there's also a post on EM docs about specifically about the use of furosemide, but delves a little bit deeper into some of these topics and has all of those links. So, Instead of sharing all of the articles that I read with you guys, I'll refer to you there if you want to learn more about it. All right, so let's start with a patient presentation. Patient comes in with shortness of breath. It's a 55-year-old guy. He's got end-stage renal disease, hypertension, CAD, and he says for the last couple of days, he's been increasingly short of breath, and because he's been short of breath, he's missed his last couple of dialysis sessions as well. When you look at him, he is tachypnic, he's tachycardic, his uh, oxygen levels are on 83%, and he's profusely sweating. I mean, it is pouring off of him. So you see this guy, and you know that, well, he's probably got something bad going on. You take a listen to his lungs, or you use your ultrasound, you take a look, and you're like, I think this guy's got fluid in his lungs, and that's the issue. So how are we gonna confirm the diagnosis, right? The acutely short of breath patient can have multiple different things going on. How do we confirm that diagnosis? And then how do we start our initial treatment? So the patients who come in with acute pulmonary edema, the typical things they're gonna manifest are air hunger, tachypnea, diaphoresis, and then rails or crackles. Now I always think that it's funny when we talk about, oh, I heard rails, or I think I heard, maybe it was crackles and not rails. And I don't know what any of those terms really mean, and I think it's probably easier for us to just look instead of listen. We'll talk a little more about ultrasound. So how do we confirm this diagnosis? Much of it is based on our clinical gestalt, looking at the patient and saying, I think this is what's going on based on the patient's history. I think the patient has too much fluid in their lungs. But we do have some tools that we use, things like chest x-ray. So what's the utility of a chest x-ray in making this diagnosis? It's okay. It's okay at best. The best sensitivity in any study was about 87%. Not good enough that I'm gonna rest uh, all of my laurels on using that to make this diagnosis. The limitations of that, you actually have to get a 30% increase in lung water in order to pop up pulmonary edema on a chest X-ray. That's not always gonna happen. And we always hear about, oh, the patient's chest X-ray lags behind their clinical presentation. That's a real thing. Plus, the findings on chest X-ray can be mimicked by pus or blood in the airway. So yeah, you're gonna fit that into your clinical scenario, but remember, X-ray is probably not gonna give you the definitive diagnosis. Diagnostic ultrasound, on the other hand, I think has much better performance characteristics. So this was the blue protocol that I think it's a must read for resuscitationists, for emergency physicians, looking at the utility of lung ultrasound for multiple different diagnoses and they basically found a 97% sensitivity and a 95% specificity. It's pretty good. When we're talking about diagnostic studies, this is probably as good as it gets. This is what we're looking for, thanks to Marcia for this particular video. We're looking for greater than three B lines in any field. And when you're looking for this, you really should be looking in multiple fields. This isn't just, I looked here, I looked here, I see B lines. You should be looking in two or three fields on each lung field to make sure you're seeing this. And unilateral B lines, 
tells you that it's probably not acute pulmonary edema and maybe pneumonia is the process going on here. Remember when these patients come into kipnic, hypoxic, pneumonia is on the table, acute pulmonary edema, asthma, COPD, there's so many different things that this could be. But if you see B lines bilaterally, you've got your diagnosis. This is a study in Lancet just a couple years back looking at this question of how does ultrasound change our diagnostic outcome? How does it change what we think is going on? They found an undifferentiated respiratory depress, uh, excuse me, undifferentiated respiratory distress using ultrasound markedly increased our diagnostic certainty and then committing to a pathway of treatment. This one's from Academic Emergency Medicine 2014, Systematic Review Meta-Analysis, taking all of this data together, and here's what they found. They found that the positive likelihood ratio for ultrasound for making this diagnosis was 12.4. Remember, a positive likelihood ratio over 10 is what we're shooting for. This one was 12. This is a very robust positive likelihood ratio. We would like it on the other side too, right? We don't just want the positive, we want the negative likelihood ratio. That one was pretty good too, 0.06. 0.1 is the threshold for a negative likelihood ratio. So again, very robust findings that we see from diagnostic ultrasound. And I don't have to wait for the portable chest x-ray to come. If it's the middle of the night, you guys know at NYU, there's only one person doing portable x-rays in the middle of the night. And if he's in the unit, you're not getting that portable x-ray for 10, 15, half an hour. But I have diagnostic ultrasound at the bedside. I can make this diagnosis much more rapidly than relying on a chest x-ray, which already is a subpar tool. All right, let's get back to the patient and those clinical features. Again, remember, air hunger, tachypnea, diaphoresis, and here's our patient, doesn't look so good. And when you think about the presentation for this patient, what they've got is a catecholaminergic overdrive. It is like they are sniffing cocaine, right? They're sweaty, they're tachycardic, they're hypertensive. This is what we're seeing. And this is the pathophysiology that's going on. This is the one pathophysiology slide because I can't find a better pathophysiology slide for this particular topic, but this one lays out what's going on. This is the model that we understand now, the neurohormonal model for acute pulmonary edema or decompensated heart failure. If you go back in time to the 50s, we thought that this was just solely fluid overload, that it was the kidneys and the heart, and we moved forward into different models, and now we've really settled on this neurohormonal model. So what happens is that there's some primary insult to the heart. As a result of that, we get sympathetic activation because there's decreased cardiac output. That sympathetic activation happens with things like norepinephrine. Those neurotransmitters, those neurohormones are cardiotoxic when they're going on for a long time. You get a secondary insult, decreased left ventricular function. Now at the same time when there's an acute insult on top of that primary myocardial injury or the underlying myocardial injury the patient has, you get activation of the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. And again, that neurohormonal effect gives you a negative effect on the heart and how it can output blood. Those uh, renin angiotensin aldosterone, all of those things, they're gonna cause vasoconstriction which makes the heart work harder. Eventually the heart can't work any harder. It can't work uphill forever and the left, ventricular, uh, left ventricle fails. So increased preload that's coming in, the left ventricle can't handle it, it starts to fail and blood starts backing up into the lungs. As blood backs up into the lungs, just because of oncotic pressure, the way that pressure systems work, the water starts leaking out into the lung tissue. And in essence, what you have is your patient's drowning. But instead of drowning in the ocean, they're drowning in their own fluids. And this is how we need to look at this disease. Pathophysiologically, if you look at it this way, it makes a lot of sense of how we're gonna treat it. So Al Sacchetti, one of my mentors, uses the bathtub model for acute pulmonary edema. So you've got a bathtub and it's filling up with water. At this point, this is the lungs, that's your bathtub. There's water coming in and there's no water going out. In order to relieve this system, you have to both stop the water coming in and then you gotta unplug the lungs so they can unload. If you only affect in one of those two things, you're not gonna have a good outcome for the patient. The patient is not gonna recover. So if you think about it this way, again, I think this is a nice way to picture it, overflowing bathtub, you gotta unplug it and you gotta stop the flow of water in. So how do we start our medical resuscitation here? And I think that the, the uh, life preserver is the right way to think about this in the drowning patient. And when we talk about, again, with our treatments, this analogy makes a lot of sense. So let's start with respiratory support. This guy comes in, he's 83%, he's tachypnic. The patients usually tend to be a little bit on the older side and you wanna intubate them. We all wanna intubate them. 
I remember when I was a third year, when you worked overnights, we would get a patient every morning, sometime around 6, 6.30, that's when the catecholaminergic surge begins in the morning, and they would come in and floor acute pulmonary edema, and we would intubate them. It was like a no, you knew it was coming. It was dependable that you would intubate an acute pulmonary edema around 6, 6.30 in the morning. Now we're a little bit better about handling these, and we don't see as many of these intubations because we use non-invasive positive pressure ventilation. Non-invasive positive pressure ventilation has stolen more intubations from you guys than anything else that exists. Okay, I can't tell you how many more tubes you would have if we didn't know how to use this particular modality properly. But I'll tell you, the one big limitation of what I see us do is that when a patient comes in who needs non-invasive, we go over, we call respiratory, and then we wait for someone to meander down to set up the machine. This is not rocket science. And the reason I know that this is not rocket science is because I know that Alan can do it, okay? <laughs> Alan demonstrated for all of us that he can do this with Salil's help, but that's not important. So we have a great video on setting up non-invasive positive pressure ventilation, and this is the difference between understanding the strategy and understanding the tactics and actually knowing how to carry out the logistics of a resuscitation. You know that non-invasive has to be done, but do you know how to do that non-invasive? I'm not waiting for respiratory to come down to do that. We should be doing it on our own because what this does is it decreases work of breathing, it stents open the alveoli, it actually physically pushes the fluid back into the circulation and out of the alveoli, and it decreases afterload. This has a huge benefit for our patients, but remember, 10 minutes, that's how much time you have to make an effect. How many times have you guys called respiratory and they weren't down in 10 minutes? We know this happens, it's not their fault. Again, on the overnight, it's one person covering the entire hospital. You have to be able to do this. Does it matter whether we use bi-level or uh, CPAP? Probably not. This is the one study that looked at this and basically they did show decreased ICU admissions, 38% in the CPAP, I'm sorry, 38% in the BiPAP group versus 92% in the CPAP group. That looks really, really good for BPAP, but it was a small study. This is the best we have. I use BPAP because it physiologically makes more sense, but if you wanna use CPAP instead, I don't really care. Just get them on non-invasive ventilation. All right, let's talk about medications. And many of the treatments that we talk about in acute pulmonary edema are actually snake oil treatments. There's no evidence that any of these work. You might as well give them homeopathic treatment instead if you wanna do something, but we need to focus on the things that actually make a difference. So here are the things that don't make a difference, but they're often part of algorithms or you hear people use them. Morphine. Does morphine help patients with acute decompensated heart failure? No. It does, though, help you get those intubations back from the non-invasive ventilation. This is the ADHERE database that looked at this question. This was association, it wasn't causality, and they showed basically increased intubation rates and worse outcomes in the patients who got morphine. Morphine does not help here. This is a nice study by Al Sacchetti. Again, these are associations, they're not causality. ICU admissions were increased by threefold, intubation by fivefold. So again, if you've got a ton of ICU beds lying around and you haven't done a tube in a while, go ahead and give them some morphine so you can intubate them. There's a more extensive review on this particular topic on Rebel EM from Salim Rezai. So again, I'll refer you over to that instead of going through all of the literature. How about loop diuretics? Again, this makes sense. How many times have you seen a patient with acute decompensated heart failure and somebody wants to give them loop diuretics? And you say, what I did, it's like, well, you didn't give them enough. Give them more, give them more, give them more loop diuretic. So do loop diuretics help in these patients? Well, the question really is, are they overloaded? Well, yes and no. Their lungs are overloaded, but are they total body overloaded? And the answer to that question from multiple studies, these are just three of them that are out there, is no. They are not total body overloaded. Less than 50% of the patients that we see with acute decompensated heart failure are total body volume overloaded. And remember, of those 50% of patients that are total body volume overloaded, a good percent of those patients have end-stage renal disease. What's the dose of Lasix to make an end-stage renal disease patient pee? Does anybody know? Yeah, I don't know either. It's like a million milligrams. Uh, I don't know, I, that's, the, that's the number I'm gonna come up with. There is no dose, because if there was a dose, somebody would be making a lot of money. I made this guy pee again with 100,000 milligrams of Lasix. So a lot of these patients, they're not gonna to respond to Lasix even if you get it to them, and most of them aren't fluid overloaded total body anyway. So it's not gonna help them. In fact, early on in management, there might be a detriment here. So vascular congestion in the lungs does not equal fluid overload. Where is that fluid coming from? 
probably the Splanknik circulation. The Splanknik circulation is very, it's, it's able to tolerate a lot of volume. It can vasodilate very easily and it can keep a lot of blood volume there. But when these patients get sick, everything constricts up and that fluid shifts out of the gut and it goes into the circulation, the general circulation, and then that pours into the lungs. So what we need to do is not get the fluid out of their body, we just need to reshift it back to where it came from. Now the thing that I often hear when I explain all of this is that, but they're harmless. Lasix are harmless, but are they truly harmless? <laughs> and only people that are old enough will get the reference of the killer rabbit from Monty Python. If you're not getting this reference, I'll tell you again, go watch the Holy Grail. Um, I exempt you from your shift today to go watch the Holy Grail. I'm not working, so I don't care. So there are a number of articles looking at the detriments of using Lasix. This is one of the ones that summarizes it. I also like how it's phrased. Uh, loop diuretics and acute decompensated heart failure, necessary, evil, necessary, evil. Uh, they're not necessary is really the bottom line. What you see is that these things actually decrease cardiac output up to 20%. 20% reduction in cardiac output, increased afterload, increased activation of the neurohormonal system, which I told you was critical in how this comes up in the first place. So these patients actually do worse when they get Lasix. All right, so if Lasix and morphine don't work, what actually does work? One of my favorite drugs, one of ED favorite drugs, which is nitroglycerin. Nitroglycerin works in these patients. It works because remember that analogy of the lungs getting flooded and we gotta stop the flow in, that's preload, and we also have to resume flow out, that's afterload. Nitrates work on both of those. At low doses, nitrates are gonna help to stop the preload to stop the flow of blood in by vasodilating, basically increasing the venous capacitance. But at higher doses, they relieve afterload as well. So they're gonna help you unload the lungs too. The key with nitrates is to use them early and to use them at high doses. So what's a high dose of Lasix? This is a talk that I gave before. I know um, Bob and I have talked about this of what dose can you go to? So typically these patients, we start with some sublingual nitroglycerin. How much sublingual nitro, how much milligrams are in a sublingual nitroglycerin? So 0.4, right? So it's 400 micrograms in every sublingual nitro. Now that's not instantaneously absorbed. That's absorbed over about four to five minutes. That's why you give them Q5 minutes. And it doesn't all get absorbed. But the best studies looking at this show that it's probably the equivalent of 60 to 80 mics per minute. So a 400 microgram sublingual nitro is about equivalent to 60 to 80 micrograms per minute. That is the bare minimum starting point when you put up a drip. You've already shown that the patient can tolerate the sublingual nitro. You should have shown that they can tolerate 60 to 80 mics. So then why would you start the drip at 10 mics? 10 mics is a no dose, right? That's homeopathic. We should dilute it again and again and again and again. Give them a real dose of nitroglycerin. So if I give them sublingual nitro, they tolerate that. I start at 100 and I rapidly titrate that up. I have in the past couple of years gotten to very high doses, four or 500 micrograms. I thought those were high doses until I read a paper that was from Phil Levy, one of our graduates who works in Detroit, where they were loading patients with two milligrams of nitroglycerin. They gave them infusions of 2,000 mics for the first couple minutes, and then they dropped that down and then titrated it up again as needed. So they were loading them with these huge doses. That was just a small study looking at, did anyone die from us giving those doses? And the answer was no. So I'm not doing that. I'm not giving them two milligrams, although I think Phil would tell you that it's safe to do that. I'm starting with 100 and rapidly going up. This is a great review article from Paul Merrick, one of the real gurus on critical care and resuscitation, looking at nitro, reviewing all of the data. And he says, you know, nitro is one of the few drugs that we can all uniformly agree should be recommended in these patients with acute decompensated heart failure. It's one of the few drugs that's been shown to improve outcomes. But again, the, the deal here is that you gotta use higher doses in order to get that afterload reduction. Most people say once you get over 100 mics per minute, you're getting to afterload reduction area. Um, so that's a good place to start, rapidly titrate up. So high dose again is the key. What that high dose is, it's gonna depend on who you are, but I'm starting at 100 and going quickly up. How about ACE inhibitors? Not a drug that we use very often in the emergency department. I've used this once or twice in patients with acute decompensated heart failure. There are a couple of small studies uh, that show that there may be some benefit here, but they're not necessarily in the outcomes that we're looking at. I would say that I would reserve this as a plan B in patients who I've ratcheted up my nitro, I haven't seen the effect that I wanted. I might add the ACE inhibitor. 
Honestly, since being more comfortable with using the higher doses of nitro, I haven't needed to use ACE inhibitors. But it's something that you might hear being used. All right, so let's go back to our patient. So we started BiPAP very quickly on this patient uh, because we knew how to set it up. We didn't wait for respiratory to do so. We started them on a high dose of nitro. We started at 150 mics per minute through the IV, rapidly titrated up to about 300 mics before we really felt we were getting the impact that we needed. And what you often see is you titrate it up really quickly, they're on that dose for a couple of minutes, five, 10 minutes, and then all of a sudden they look better, and now you can start pulling your nitro back. So you've reversed that neurohormonal cascade, you've reversed that pathophysiology, and now you can start titrating that back, and that's exactly what happened in this patient. We started titrating it back, we actually gave him a break off of his bi-level to see how he felt without it. The lab started coming back, his BNP was elevated, we didn't need that to make the diagnosis. His chest x-ray showed acute pulmonary edema, we didn't need that to make the diagnosis. And his trope was about 10 or 11. The EKG didn't show a clear STEMI, but he was taken up to the cath lab anyway. What are the take home points here? Acute pulmonary edema is a life-threatening disease, and the management that you give the patient in the first 10 minutes is gonna make all the difference. And what you need to do in that first 10 minutes is not waste time with things like morphine, not waste time with things like Lasix. What you need to be giving them is putting them on a BiPAP and giving them high dose nitrates to decrease their preload, to decrease their afterload, and to stem that neurohormonal tide. Once that happens, once you reverse that neurohormonal tide, you can reassess them and determine whether they're volume overloaded total body and they need a dose of furosemide, that's fine. But up front, that first 10 minutes, it's gonna do more harm than good. It definitely wastes time. Get the nitro drip up, get them on the BiPAP. Most of these patients don't need intubation if you're aggressive with your non-invasive positive pressure ventilation. And of course, remember to look for an underlying cause. Most of these patients are gonna be ischemic, they're gonna have an infarction, but things like infection, dysrhythmias, all of those things can throw these patients into acute pulmonary edema as well. Well, that's all for the Core EM podcast this week. Come on over and check out the site at coreem.net where we've got a ton of great core content emergency medicine. We'll have a core post up on Wednesday and a journal update up on Thursday. Don't forget to check out our Facebook page, follow us on Google+, and on Twitter where our handle is at core underscore EM. Thanks, and see you all next week.